Lamentations chapter 3, verse 33, states something quite remarkable. Now, let me just paraphrase verse 33 for you, and I want to bring out a hidden word that's not translated in any English translation that I know of currently. It's a hidden Hebrew word. It's translated heart. It's lib. It says, God does not afflict or punish willingly from his heart, nor is it in his heart to grieve the sons of men or punish the sons of men. So what's this saying, folks, is that God does not willingly afflict anybody, but there comes a time due to repeated abuse and rejection of his mercy and grace that a time without remedy is reached and God's wrath is fully justified to be implemented and unleashed on earth. The 16th letter of the Hebrew alphabet is Ayin. Let me bring it up here on the screen here so you can see it. And it's paleopictograph is of an I. Its numeric value is 70, folks. And the Hebrew spelling for the word I consists of three letters which bring out a deeper truth in the Bible deciphered according to the context of Scripture that it's found in. You have to decipher and, and through Bible numbers through the context of Scripture which it's found in. So I'm going to look at the root meanings here. So let's look further at this word ayin here and see what I'm talking about. Ayin or I in the Hebrew is spelled in ancient paleo is read from right to left as ayin, which is the value of 70, yod, number 10, and nun, 15. And listen to what it says in Psalms 32, verse 8. God says, I'll instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will guide you with my ayin. My ayin, my ayod nun, okay? I'm going to guide you that way. What does this mean? So, folks, we need to understand what the picture graphs mean. So, let's look at what the picture graphs mean. So, you can just, just keep tracking with me here. I'm going somewhere with this. Yod, number 10, is a picture graph of an extended arm, denoting a strong arm that aids, helps, teaches us how to live res responsibly before God and each other, often through injunctions or written instructions, okay? None fi is 50. It's a uh, picture graph is the shape of a sprouting seed that's seeking light as well as a fiery serpent who reflects light from the sun. That is actually what uh, the word 50 is. So the, the idea of 50 is year of Jubilee, right? So it's new life being able to sprout forth free from the fiery serpent's hold. Okay, that's the kind of the idea of Jubilee. I don't think people understand this because they try to, with biblical numbers, they try to simplify this and they miss it by a hundred miles of what's being said within a text. Okay, let's keep tracking with me here. So the numeric meaning of 70 yod and nun and 50 helps uncover what God is guiding his people with his eye looks like. Remember, the Lord promises to guide his people with his eye. What does that mean? So let's look at that. So let's look at the numeric value of ayin, yod, and nun, along with the numeric root meanings, and we're going to find out what they mean. Number 70's root meaning means to guide, counsel, through perception, discernment, knowledge, and understanding. That's the root meaning of 70. So God promises to guide us through his discernment, counsel, knowledge, and understanding. How? Through yod. From his arm, sent to aid, to help to teach us how to live responsibly before God and each other. In fact, Isaiah 53 verse 1 says, Who has seen or who has heard of the arm of the Lord? Okay, None is uh, 50, so we can sprout upward seeking his light as opposed to the fiery serpent who likes to change reflection of light into his own light and drown out God's light. You gotta remember, Jesus in John chapter 8, verse 12 says, He said to them again, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Again, the idea is that you're going to get away from walking in the counsel of the devil, the world, and the flesh, and begin to be guided by God's eye, okay? Guided by his perception. His knowledge, his discernment, his understanding, sent by Jesus, the arm of the Lord, so you can seek his light. You know, what does it mean by God guides us with his eye, okay? Well, let's add ayin, yod, and nun together, like this. And you get 70 plus 10 equals 80. 80 is 
pay. Pay is shape of a mouth. It means words that come out of the mouth. It means the word, the mouth, you speak. It's the expression of intelligence through speech. It matches the word logos, seen in John chapter uh, 1, verse 1. Okay, In the beginning was the word, the logos, and the logos was with, with, with God. That's what it means. Then you add pay to plus 50, you get 130. So you come up with the sum 70, 80, 130, which what being guided by God, I, involves. This shows you what it involves, okay? And this is what it means. It means God's foresight, vision, discernment, perception, knowledge, and understanding comes by the mouth of, of God. Why? To avoid despising, abusing the inheritance, legacy, authority, and even the word God gives. And so through God's foresight, vision, and discernment, perception, and knowledge, and understanding that comes from the mouth of God, he'll keep you from despising his inheritance. So when it says that God's going to guide you with his eye, that's what that means. He wants to, give, to keep you from abusing his words, his promises, his inheritance, his authority that he's given you. Eventually you didn't think of that. So we're going to go to Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. Now the serpent and the kosh was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said you will not eat of every tree of the garden? The serpent is the word nakash. Its first letter is nun. That's the pictograph, the shape of a sprouting seed that's seeking light, as well as a fiery serpent who reflects light from the sun. Okay? So the devil, he was in the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Evil is ra. And it's shimmering in its light, seeking to means to alter the light into his own reflection to enter into man whose image and likeness was to reflect God's light so what was going on here was that the devil was tr was going to get mankind away from reflecting the light and image of God that we were to designed to reflect which was to basically rule our world by the fruit of the spirit love joy peace and instead Get it to reflect his light of manipulating good and evil for your own benefit. You know, a light shines off of a fiery serpent, and you see it, it shimmers and glimmers. Or a serpent can soak up light so you can't see it it's in, the, in the bush. Well, camouflage, it doesn't reflect the light. So it soaks in the light in order to, to seek its prey and strike you at the right time. And you don't even see it. That's the idea of a serpent. So you have several serpents that are shimmering and shining in the world. Like it says in the Bible, fiery serpents. And uh, they kind of look like the desert floor, but they reflect the same light that's off the desert floor. And they strike you, okay? And they, and they, they do harm. Uh, they can kill you if you don't see them. So the devil is trying to get his light, his perception, his understanding his discernment into you. That's the idea. That's his venom. The paleo root letters and their numeric meaning for nakash is, is nun, kek, and shin, which is 78 and 300. This reveals the devices that the devil and his minions employ to dampen the light to reflect their own in your life and in my life. Would you like to know what that means? Uh, 50 means the perception, discernment, knowledge, and understanding that guides a person. So the devil's going to guide you with his d discernment and knowledge. Keck is a pictograph of a wall or an inner room that separates the old from the new. Hence, new beginnings or an era or a new place. That's why number eight has uh, come to known as new beginnings because it's a wall that separates it something into something new. And Shin is a pictograph of teeth. I'm not kidding you. It's a pictograph of, uh, of two front teeth. On the top part of your mouth, okay? What does that mean? It's, there's a lot in there, but I don't have time to go through it all, but we're going to look at it here. It represents your spirit and breath that goes between the teeth, as well as consuming as eating and destroying or partaking of nourishment for empowerment. That's the idea of, of that. And the idea of spirit gives you nourishment. A spirit can consume you. A bad spirit can consume you. God's Holy Spirit can empower you. Okay, that's what that idea of the idea of, of spirit, so the number 300 comes from. 
Keep tracking with me. We're going somewhere with this. Keep looking on the screen. So you put these three together and you translate them according to the context of Genesis chapter 3. And thus a Nakash offers his perception, discernment, knowledge, and understanding to guide humanity to be in control of all. Become divine by following his light, his illumination. Folks, the devil is called the ruler of this world system. How? Through eight. Through these one achieves a new beginning, a new era that separates from God's light. That is the entire purpose of the devil, to separate you from God's light into his light. His, be guided by his perception and stuff. If you don't understand that, you won't, you, your, your spiritual warfare will be kind of weak. You don't know what you're fighting. And to number 300, living a new spiritual Divine empowerment to consume, devour, destroy God's order, creation, and design to make a new world as its new gods. Governed by that cunningly shrewd, nakashious perception, discernment, knowledge, and understanding. In other words, the devil seeks to alter humanity into his own image and likeness in order to er erase the image and likeness we were originally created in to govern the world by the fruit of the Spirit. This same offer is seen in... The temptation of Christ in Luke chapter 4, verses 1 through 13. I'm not going to go there right now, but again, I'm, going, I'm trying to say Bible interprets Bible. <clears throat> what I'm teaching you and showing you lines up with Scripture so well that it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's beyond belief when you look at it. So, let's add the numbers 58 and 300 together to find out more about the Nakashas offer and what it causes human beings to do to each other. 50 plus 8. Remember, 8 is new beginnings that bring separation. And 58 means a worldly life that causes weeping, woe, that causes one to seek relief, mercy, help, comfort, and aid. At 58 to 300, and, and 358 means plundering, pillaging other folks of their wealth, glory, possessions, authority, crowns, and birthright to increase one's own empowerment, wealth, prestige, and benefit. And this is what the devil does. This creates conditions for evil to run rampant. So what the devil's purpose is, is cause a worldly life that causes weeping, woe, and misery where you seek relief and mercy and help. And so you crawl into a bottle, you smoke the dope, you escape into movies, you go to umpteen concerts, you, uh, you get into all kinds of stuff to, right? devil's about plundering and pillaging other folks of their wealth, glory, possessions, authority, crowns, and birthright to increase one's own empowerment, wealth, prestige, and benefit. This is the devil's light. He gives you the perception and, and illusion that this is the right way to go, and you're going to bring utter destruction, misery, and woe into the world. Describe to me what's happening in progressive-run cities here in the United States and elsewhere in the world. What happened in Madagascar? Uh, recently when they went to full green energy stuff mass starvation and riots in the street you don't hear about that anymore everything's silence you don't hear about the protest in europe right now you don't hear uh, silence silence because they're going to implement this plan knowing it's going to cause woe grief and destruction because that because they're powers that be are under the sway of the evil one to think they're doing a good thing and they have to tear down God's order and design to create an, another new utopia. That's what I am talking about, folks. If this, is, this stuff is real. It's happening before your eyes and you've never been able to quite understand it. Serpent Nakash was more cunning than any beast of the field that the Lord God has made, okay? Nakash was in the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, Ra. Ra, evil is just two paleo letters, I-N and Resh. That's Resh, not Rest. Resh is the picture of a person's head, meaning headship, full of knowledge needed to rule, one who can cause emphasis, insufficiency, lack, or sufficiency and abundance. That's what it means. So the, 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 the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, uh, you have... Um, this is where the idea of the tree of knowledge brings sufficiency or inefficiency. I mean, goodness means it works, it's functional or dysfunctional. That's the idea where that came from. Some of you understand theology. That, that's where that idea comes from, the word Ra. That's what Ra does. It manipulates good and evil to get its own purpose, uh, to get its own way, to destroy God's order, design, and uh, reflect itself. And it causes woe and misery.
Keep tracking with me. So Resh is a picture of a head, meaning headship, full knowledge needed to rule so you can cause insufficiency or sufficiency, abundance. Evil comes by one's ion, his eye, his perception, his discernment, knowledge, and understanding that gives one Resh the ability to control insufficiency, lack, or sufficiency, or abundance, hence to work good and evil for one's personal benefit and profit, just like these words means. You want to... Uh, you have a new beginning that's going to bring worldly life that causes weeping because you can get wealth and pillage and get prosperous by doing that. And that's why we're seeing this evil grow rampant. Because the devil sitting in the tree of knowledge reflecting this light to pervert God's light and change it over. And thus the devil became the god of this world. And that is the world system. And he governs the sin nature. I hate to say that to you, but uh, we, if, you're, if you're not a Christian, you're totally controlled by it. You may not like the idea of that. But, um, but when you become a born again, you, come, you learn to walk out of that system. And our churches fail to teach that too much these days. So what am I trying to say here? So, okay. So the devil is in the tree of knowledge of good and evil, shimmering in its light, seeking the means to alter it in, into his own reflection. You enter in humanity, Adam and Eve, whose image and likeness we were created to reflect God's light in the world, his love, joy, peace, the fruit of the Spirit. Adam was warned, but he fell away from being led by God's foresight, vision, discernment, and he was no longer guided by God's discernment. This is right, this is wrong. Um, why was that important? Because it uh, taught us to avoid despising and abusing the inheritance. But this was rejected in exchange for being governed by the devil's uh, perception, knowledge, and understanding in exchange for his inheritance, which is just mere plunder. And from this point on, there arose what the Bible calls the great men of the earth who seek to plunder other folks. But, folks, what I'm trying to say is we live in a world where those in great power seek to plunder us of our authority, wealth, glory, possessions, and birthright. Do we not? Revelation chapter 18 identifies these folks as the great merchants and the great men of the earth who are uh, under the spell that plundering uh, Babylonian spirit is okay. They are under this, the spell of this Babylonian spirit. This, uh, this devil spirit that wants, wants to uh, plunder, rob, take everything, and they're going to control everything, redistribute it, and make a perfect world. Because they're going to make the world in their image and their likeness that the devil wants them. They're under the influence of something. Like I said in this prior messages of this series, God sends a warning in many diverse ways, even in the secular world, as well as in the occult world. In the occult world, Alice Bailey mentions how the hierarchy, the Ephesians 612 crowd, plans to externalize themselves on earth again by 2025. And I quote here from Externalization of the Hierarchy, page 281. Thus, a great new movement is proceeding and tremendously increased interplay and interaction is taking place. This will go on until A.D. 2025. During the years intervening between now and then, very great changes will be seen taking place. In 2025, the date in all probability will be set for the first stage of the externalization of the hierarchy, end quote. These enter into the world of human beings by the means of overshadowing certain folks, possessing them to think that they are on a holy crusade for good to create a more loving, kind, more tolerant, more equitable, more inclusive, just world. Well, you own nothing and you will be happy about it. If you disagree, then you will be erased. You will be browbeaten. You will be attacked by the mob because we are so loving and kind. We see the insanity happening world that are wide around us. And you wonder why? Because we're going to teach you right human relations and beat it into you. Says the bald headed bimbo from Davos. That's the plan. This hierarchy of the type of people they influence, it, it's revealed in secular psychology. They're identified as the dark trinity of personality traits. I'm not talking about the dark trinity of the angelic realm. I'm talking about the dark trinity as the secular world calls it, of personality traits. The dark trinity of personality involves three types of dangerous personality traits. What are these? There are three types of people that and what they do is they seek each other out and they build a coalition with each other. They do. 
they are found mostly in the top of the food chain. In other words, you see these type of people with power have gone to their head. That's why they call the dark trinity. These people feed off of each other. Some of them are involved in dark occulted practices and crafts. John Pendesta's spirit cooking email is a prime example of that. They identify themselves as having the right to rule over the people, to make a new perfect world. It sounds just like the serpent in the tree. We're going to guide you with VAR, with VAR, visions for the humanity, of inclusion, equity, and redistribution of your wealth, not ours, but yours. Yes. The dark trinity of personality is broken down in three distinct groups of people with certain personality traits, all on a sliding scale from covert, moderate, to overt. There's different scales, okay? The dark trinity of personality are as follow. The psychopathic, the Machiavellian, and the narcissistic personality types. When all three gel into one person, they develop into a megalomania complex. That's what megalomania is. The Machiavellian, I'm going to go through these really quickly. I'm going to give you a bullet point, uh, simplistic definition. I can't go into all the details of each one of the personality traits. But the Machiavellian personality traits seeks power to dominate and destroy. Their model is the ends justify the means. They have no moral compass. They're, um, they're an overt in acquiring a power and control. And they want to destroy your life just for the mere pleasure. It's almost sadistic in a way. They are utterly ruthless. They are vile human beings who in justify the means. They'll lie, cheat, steal, break laws. They'll set people in power, uh, the psychopaths and narcissists in power, to keep them from ever having to face any type of justice. You'll see them mostly in politics. You'll see some of them even in churches. You'll see them about everywhere, even in the corporate world. You'll see them, these Machiavellian types. Um, it's all about absolute dominance of power for power's sake alone. Like the other traits, they all seek to well total control of the people, but the Machiavellian is the worst because they just it's just power. They can't explain anything. I learned this in college, folks. You know, I, were, I was in college, and uh, so I had a lot of Marxist professors because I was in social work. And I asked them, who, who, are we, who are we getting power for? The power for the people? No, it's not the power of the people because the people don't get any benefit from this. They just get used like stepping stones. You use the poor, the downprodden, and, and stuff, to, to, and, and, and legitimate maybe concerns to acquire power for who? And they could never answer me. And I found out who. It's, it's, it's for the Machiavellian personality traits who are in the political power who want to control ruthlessly all manner of your life. Now, the psychopathic lacks empathy, but he can appear charming and nice, so they need the psychopathics to work through because they can be charming and nice, nice like you know, Ted Bundy was very charming and nice. But he was a serial, a serial killer, okay? So psychopathics lack empathy, but can appear charming and nice and charm the socks off you. This is a mind game they play, a gaslighting game. They, and actually, they seek dominance and power, too. They are diabolically nefarious, in a way, especially in the field of politics and business. They, they, care about, um, they don't care about any damage they do to people. Um, all, they were, is, all they want to do is control people's life to feel better about themselves. You know, it's almost, they just have this urge to control people, well, that control, and they like it. Sort of a satanic type of thing. In fact, it is. It's, I call it overshadowing. Then you have the narcissistic that seeks to control of others to fill the need for pleasure, okay? And life is all about them. They are lovers of self and lovers of pleasure. They take detailed notes, like uh, over-the-top notes of, uh, of a person's life when they're and they, and they track you. You made this phone call. You did this. Well, some of you lived under narcissists, and they like to take detailed notes. It's like I said, and they'll every type of move in your life so they can eventually checkmate you for the mere pleasure of controlling you. They, may, they plan their, methodically plan their next moves and how to manipulate you psychology, through a psycho, psychological means in order to get what they want to derive pleasure of a mere control. A mere control of watching you uh, 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 um, squirm. They gaslight. That's how they control, okay? 
all three, it's all about power and control. And all three uh, dreams about being able to surveil and mon monitor everything you do. They want to control all of life's resources. I'm, I'm speaking to you from a professional level because in my career path, working in working in um, criminal justice system, working with uh, sex offenders and so forth, etc., that's what they do. They want to surveil everything and monitor everything you do. I worked with all three of these personality types every single day in my career path. And... Uh, uh, I can't get into all the details of how we confronted them, but you can't let them have dominance. You can't. The devil puts these three together uh, uh, to work off of each other in order to create a brave new dystopic world. That's his idea. He gets people under his control of the Machiavellian, psychopathic, and uh, the narcissistic people working together like in the World Economic Forum in order to create a brave new world that they control. Okay, the Bible describes this world in the last days, and, and we'll see it. Jesus warned about it as coming in the days of Noah and Lot will closely resemble the time before he comes. And he calls us to watch, and watch therefore for these times. And so we're going to see the Machiavellian mindset, the psychopathic, and the narcissistic working together to create a brave new world, a top-down control based on the devil's guidance, his reason, his intelligence, and so forth, etc. Everything I just said about the letter I in there, he's going to guide you with the devil's eye, okay? His illumination of, of discernment, how to be Machiavellian, how to control it all, okay? And the days of Lot are crazy, insane sexual depravity. We're altering this going on big time nowadays. Instead of chanting, give us your men, as they said in Genesis chapter 19, they're saying, give us your children, if you haven't noticed. Can you explain to me this stuff? This is a Machiavellian, this is the psychopathic, and this is the narcissistic, working together in this dark trinity of personality, and I'm speaking in a secular sense, to bring this about. Paul warns of this age to come as seen big time in the last days in 2 Timothy chapter 3. It's perilous times where, where folks are living it out and all the world to see. They are lovers of self-pleasure. They're brutal, headstrong, despisers of good because they're, they are uh, going to co-op everybody into the middle of the triangle. You have the Machiavellian, the psychopath, and, and the narcissistic. They want everybody into the middle of this triangle to control them. These people are overshadowed and possessed and under the influence of the occult hierarchy. I'm talking about people who maintain some semblances of mental rationality, and you can't even tell they're possessed. Yet, as opposed to somebody like Ted Bundy, who was actually possessed, came off as charming, but, he, but you know that he was a devil. Okay? These are the fallen entities that Alice Bailey wrote about, that she channeled. She stated that through the manner of influence, you gain control over all the mountains of influence, all the cultural mountains of influence by inserting these types of people into it to control it all for the purpose of preparing the way for the occult Messiah to come to, to rule the world again like it was in the days of Noah, perhaps, you know, or in, uh, to think of um, Nimrod's taste. This plan is going to set the stage for this world leader to appear whom we call the Antichrist. And it's a system. It mirrors the devil's mindset. What's the devil's mindset? Again, is to uh, sway you get through discernment, <clears throat> give you knowledge, understanding, so forth. His understanding that leads to creating woe and misery in order to control people's lives and dominate through fear. Because the Machiavellian narcissist and the psychopathic govern through fear. God has not given us a spirit of fear. That's what the Bible says. They don't like Christians because God didn't give us a spirit of fear. We conquer it. We, we, we are diametrically opposed to this system. All this stuff has been going on for a long time, and the over evidence is overwhelming. The hierarchy externalizes on earth in the closing in on the year 2025 and afterwards. As Alice Bailey said they would. We see it now before our eyes. If you don't believe me, how do you explain again what we're seeing? We see the dark trinity types leading the way. The Machiavellian carrying out their plans through an anarchist of today. 
The dark trinity of personality are found everywhere where there is power. In the media, entertainment, business, political, science, so forth, etc. They are at the top of the food chain. They manipulate those at, in, the, in the fields below them slowly to initiate them to bring the world under this trinity of control. This trinity of control is also seen in the book of Revelation and the devil, the false prophet, and the Antichrist as well. Okay, so we see th these organizations implementing ESG scores, and that's environmental, social, and governance score. If you have a good score that corresponds to paganism, you, you, you'll get loans, and you can pay your payroll. But if you don't, we'll cut your throat, because we've got to teach you right human relations. We've got, we've got to get rid of you if you don't comply, because we're loving and tolerant and kind, so we're going to beat you to submission. And you have the uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion scores, too. And so you have diversity, equity, and inclusion training. If you don't comply, you, we're going to take all your money from away because if we control the money, we control you. So the majority of folks in these fields are under the sway of the top levels of these personality traits, okay? But the people below them are not. They're just doing their jobs. They're slowly being initiated into this mindset to comply. They're, they're falsely gaslighted to believe who they're working for is for the betterment of humanity. It's not. And it's those at the top of the food chain, there are, there's ample evidence that this is going on. And they're very open about it. They're the great merchants of the earth. And I want you to, I'm going to go through these, um, these articles here. I want you to look on your screen. French newspaper, Le Monde Diplomat. Our diplomatic world, May 1999, says, and I quote, There seems to be nothing to prevent the transitional corporations taking possession of the planet and subjecting humanity to the dictatorship of capital in order to crush any thought of organized resistance to the supporters of the new order world. Tremendous police and military forces are being used to establish a doctrine of repression, end quote. U.S. billionaire David Rockefeller, Newsweek International, February 1st, 1999, said this, and I quote, Somebody has to take government's place, and business seems to me to be the logical entity to do it, end quote. Again, U.S. President Roosevelt's son-in-law, Curtis Dahl, says, wrote, and my exploited father-in-law said this, and I quote, and listen carefully, the powers of financial capitalism had another far-reaching aim, nothing less than to create a world system of financial control in private hands, able to dominate the political system of each country and the economy of the world as a whole. The system was to be controlled by a feudalist fashion, by the central banks of the world acting in concert by secret agreements arrived at at frequent private meetings and conferences. The apex of the system was the Bank of International Settlements in Baseli, Switzerland, a private bank owned and controlled by the world's central banks, which they themselves were private corporations. The growth of financial capitalism made it possible of centralization of world economic control and use its power for the direct benefit of financiers and the indirect injury of all other economic groups, end quote. So what they're trying to do is to create what? A feudalist system with the lords and serfs, total control by Machiavellian, psychopathic, and narcissist. In a feudalist system, 15 minute cities, 20 minute cities, 30 minute cities, where you, in, in sort of like a, what would, you, what would you call, you would call it a, uh, a fascist ghetto like they had in, in World War II. They control everything. They want a world system of financial control in private hands. They want to dominate the political systems of each country. They want to dominate and control the economy of the world. Uh, they, uh, they arrived at it frequent private meetings and conferences in 1979. A little bit before that, the World Economic Forum got, it was called something else. It became the World Economic Forum. You have meetings where? The apex of the system was the Bank of International Settlements in Basile, Switzerland. Switzerland, Davos, Switzerland. And this guy said this a long time ago, folks. This wasn't recent. <laughs> and this guy <laughs> said this a while back. This is what, you know, wow. They want a feudalist society where you bow down to the elites and you own nothing and you will be happy about it, surf. You live in your little collective hive, you know, you, your reproduction rights will be governed. 
We don't want a bunch of people cutting in on the profiteering because we're going to profiteer off of you as well. That's what these people are doing. So what this means is that utopia for these people means reverting back to a feudalistic state of lords and masters and serf enforced by financial control, just like the Bible says in Revelation 13, where nobody can buy, sell, or eat unless they comply. To arrive there, they plan periodic seasons of mass inflation to slowly wear down the greatest threat to their Machiavellian power grab ever seen, and that is the middle class. In fact, I want to bring this last slide up here. I got a few more, but this one says it all. Michael Rivaro, founder and editor of WhatReallyHappened.com, said this, and I quote, There are two reasons for the decline of living standards, both, both tied to the push for a one government world. Before national barriers may be brought down between two economies, the economies have been have to be made equal. That means equity. And since it is easier to pull the top down than the bottom up, the prosperity must and standard of living of our parents and grandparents worked hard to create must be destroyed. Finally, the history has shown that all opposition to entrenched oligarchy arises from the middle classes who have a surplus of funds needed to challenge the ruling classes. The order of the new world will have to, indeed already is, following the same model. If the general population only has enough to pay for next week's rented food, they will do as they are told. And silent weapon for quiet wars. And I quote, It is patiently impossible to discuss social engineering and the automization of society, i.g., E, I mean, the engineering of social automation systems, silent weapons, on a national or worldwide scale without implying extensive objectives of social control and destruction of human life and slavery and genocide. This manual is in itself an analog declaration of intent. Otherwise, it might be recognized as a technically formal declaration of domestic war. The solution for today's problems require an approach which is ruthlessly candid with no agonizing of religious, moral, or cultural values. I'm not reading the whole thing to you. I'll get into this another day. But, folks, that's Machiavellian. So we've got evidence of these people at the top and what they're planning to do unfolding before your eyes. Create inflation to break the system down, to rob the middle class of their wealth because you are a threat to their power grab you need to be a serf. They're the lords and masters because they have the bloodline. They, they have the right to rule you. Yavod, you own nothing on behalf of about it. We're only looking out for your best interest. We, it's all about equity, 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 and tolerance and love. We're going to teach you right human relations. If you don't comply, we are racial. Ha, ha, ha. Aren't we loving and kind? Those evil Christians want to dominate you and control you, but we want to give you liberty and freedom. But if you re resist us, we are erase you. We'll send the mob after you. We'll come after you. And you women, you no longer have women's rights at all in your own bathrooms because we are loving and kind and equitable. Devil! should get your blood boiling. Brock Adams, director of the United Nations Health Organization, said this, this is probably not, this is back in the 80s. To achieve government world, it is necessary to remove from the minds of men their individualism, loyalty to family traditions, national patriotism, and religious dogmas. Folks, we live in a Machiavellian world. That's where we're at today. And it is unnerving. I don't like it. I know you don't either. And folks, I want to say this again. Lamentations chapter 3 verse 33 states something very remarkable. And I'm going to paraphrase again. I'm going to use a hidden Hebrew word that most trans English translations don't even include. They, they try to compile it in the word willingly, but it's actually the heart. It says, God does not inflict or punish willingly from his heart, nor is it in his heart to grieve or punish the sons of men. Verse 32 says, Though he, God, causes punishment and grief, yet he will show compassion according to the multitude of his mercies. So God does not willingly afflict anyone, but there comes a time due to repeated abuse and rejection of his mercy and grace that it come, becomes a time without remedy, and God's wrath will be justified, poured out in full. We haven't reached that yet. 
there, so before all this happens, there's going to be a call from turning away from one's wicked ways. This is seen in Revelation chapter 2 and 3, in the judgment of the church. And um, I'm going to close with this note so you kind of understand what I'm trying to say. In Revelation chapter 2 and 3 is the message of the great, the so called end time revival. And it's not about prosperity or wealth or health or your empowerment, so forth. It is about returning to the Lord. I challenge you to prove me wrong on this. I really do. Because the same message that you went through umpteen times in the Old Testament and even in the New. Repent, turn from your wicked ways, and I'll heal your land. God always offers mercy and compassion. But what happens in ancient Israel is happening today. The church is, is, is apostatized. You have seven types of people in the church. In, each, in, the, in, their, in the church ages, yeah, but these are also in time groups of people seen in the last days too. And so the message goes out. And five are, are apostatizing to heaven. They're called to hold a fast to what they have and to overcome. The others are called to repent and overcome because they're not holding fast to what was given to them. They left their first love. So what happened was these people thought they were doing God's things by going after their brothers and sisters and, and these weird doctrines like predestination or whatever and browbeat you if you don't agree with them, you know, and uh, they thump their chest as the experts and they don't even see they left their first love. Then you have the Pergamos types. Oh, they're like the book of Ezekiel, you know, you know, Ezekiel warned me. He said, I looked through a hole in the wall. What did I see? I saw them practicing paganism in the temple. Well, I looked in a hole in the wall of the church and I see them in the church of Pergamos practicing paganism. But don't tell them that. There's big money involved in that. I see this. I see the Thyatirians going in the way of dominionism. Don't tell them that. Don't repent. Don't bring this paganism in the church, you know. But no, 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 no. You don't understand, Brian. We're, we're, we're Christians. We're doing this for Jesus. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you're Sardis types. You're ecumenical types. Uh, you, you're, you're dead to the Lord, totally. And um, it's all about you. It's all about um, ecumenical stuff. You're, you're one element of secret sensitive. Then you got the Laodicean mindset, rich in need of nothing, and the seeker-sensitive model of that. Oh, no, we're not doing anything wrong, but we love Jesus. We got Jesus' name attached to being ecumenical, inviting the, the pagan world into the church. We want to, you know, we're thinking God hates. We're allowing it into the church because we, 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 we love you. We're going to show Christian love to you. And you try to, so God's going to send a message to the seven churches. Wake up. Five of them are going to say, no, you know, no, no, no. So basically I did the math. And so if you have two groups, you have 14, you know, groups of people, seven with two, you know, male and female, whatever. I'm just saying, that's how I derived this. So I did the math. Out of 14 people, four make it. That is Smyrna Church and the Philadelphian groups. The persecuted church and the church who holds fast to the name of, name of Christ and holds fast to the Word of God. So there's only two of them. But the others, out of all the other seven, there's only two that will repent. That means a, a time without remedy is reached and the tribulation hits. Remember, God says he doesn't want to do this, but he knows and he offers repentance. He even offers repentance in the book of Revelation, for Christ's sake, folks. And, he's, and they don't want it. So can this be stopped? The answer is only if folks actually do what 2 Chronicles chapter 7, 14 says. If my people are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Well, what, what, what we do works. And, and, and we're doing it in the name of Jesus. Well, you're bringing paganism into the church. You're mixing the world into the church. You left your first love. You've done this. You've done that. 
you're rich in need of nothing. You, you, don't, you don't even need Jesus. Jesus is outside knocking on the door trying to get in, and you don't even answer the door. But a few of you will, but out of that fuel, roughly, there's only uh, two, two, roughly two people out of the entire seven groups of people. And multiply that by how many millions of Christians, you'll see a very small number. If it remains a small number, it's over. We're going into the tribulation period. And the Lord's coming back soon. Hallelujah. And uh, he promises, uh, he says, there's a way of escape. Watch therefore and pray that you be kind of worthy to escape these things. When the Son of Man comes in one of his days, plural. There's a day of his physical return and a day when he comes and snatches the church out of here. Don't know when that will be. But all indications, like a lot of people are beginning to see the way things are going and how the Masonic Church is rejecting anybody speaking about this, saying, have you checked yourself in a very nice, kind way to see that your doctrine is what you're teaching is correct? Can you just check? We all make mistakes, and the Lord's more than willing and merciful to take you back. Even if you're the worst heretic on the earth, even if your doctrine is so bad and so wrong, the Lord is willing to take you back. If you humble yourself and say, whoops, I made a mistake, I recant. I can't take back my books that I sold. I can't take back this stuff. I can't do that. But understand, I recant. I don't teach this anymore. Then the Lord will restrain and, uh, and the tribulation is delayed. We're at an hour where, folks, people like this, like he talked about in the French newspaper here, Diplomatic World, 1990 World, uh, in order to crush any thought or organize resistance to the supporters of the new order, tremendous police and military forces are being established, a doctrine of repression. Let's add DOJ, add the FBI, let's add your own governments, law enforcement agencies to come against you, right? Billionaire David Rockefeller, 1999, says somebody has to take government's place and business seems to be the logical entity to do it. Yep. We see evidence of this. Uh, President's son-in-law, Curtis Dow, explained uh, they want to control you in a feudalist fastum. They want to create a world system of financial control in private hands. They want to govern the political system of each country, the economies of the world. Yeah, they have meetings all over the place, folks. Why? Somebody has to take government's place, and business seems to me the logical entity to do it, right? Mm-hmm. It says that in order to achieve this... Um, before national barriers may be brought down between two economies, the economies have to be made equal or equitable. And since it's easier to pull the top down than the bottom up, the prosperity and standard of living of our parents and grandparents work hard to create must be destroyed. Uh-huh. Do you see that? Do you see it? You think I'm making this stuff up? You think that this might be some truth in this this? Document, silent weapons for quiet wars has been used in James Bond movies to set the tone for the megalomanias, you, uh, uh, villains that you see. This, this seems to be a very true doctrine and something that's not made up. They want a national worldwide scale of social control and destruction of human life, slavery, and genocide. Why did Brock Adams, director of the UN Health Organization, say to achieve the government of the world, it is necessary to remove them from the minds of men their individualism, loyalty to family traditions, national patriotism, patriotism, and religious dogmas? Why are people in high positions of authority broadcasting this stuff? And then they call you for calling them on the carpet. You're wearing a tin hat conspiracy theorist. No, I'm not. I'm just exposing their conspiracy because some conspiracies are true. Alice Bailey channeled the entire plan. Been in the woodwork since the days of Genesis chapter 6. We'll look at that next week. So folks, what can we do in the meantime? Pray that you're counted worthy to escape these things and stand before the Lord. Look unto yourselves. Pray for yourself. Pray for other people. We need a worldwide international thing of stop 
messing around with spiritual warfare, really do some spiritual warfare, and 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 say, Lord, send forth your messengers into the church, those seven churches. We give us that last chance to repent and look to yourself. Uh, you know, like I said, read the, stay with the scripture, the Bible, to to study the Word of God. Uh, look around, know what's going on. Read the signs of the time. Educate other people if, if they're willing to listen. If not, you just have to leave them behind. I hate to tell you that. No other way to say it. It's sad. It's tragic. The times we live in. But I take great re- know, knowledge that God has a plan. And he's going to get rid of this evil once and for all. I have, and you have as a believer, joy in heaven untold for eternity. And a new heavens and a new earth where there will be no more of this stuff. I look forward to the day of standing in the court of the Lord and um, I'm saying, this person, this is what they did. It says it in <laughs> Daniel chapter 7. We're going to judge angels. We're going to judge these fallen watchers. This is what these, these entities did here on earth. I bear witness. They went after me. They, they, t- they took me down. They did this to me. This is how it affected me. They're guilty. God says, bada boom, bang. Swim laps in the lake of fire. Boom, gone. No more coming back. Done. I can't wait for today. <laughs> I had this little saying. I said, Lord, if I could be kind of worthy enough to, to just, to, when it comes down, to go in my spirit man being, come down and, and grab some of these people and bring them in front of your judgment, boy. I, I, and I let you to judge them, but I would just have to be so nice to be able to grab them and put them in front of you and let them be judged. Let them quake in their shoes. These Machiavellians, these psychopaths, and these narcissistic people under the devil's influence. Well, that's it, folks. So you guys be blessed in Jesus' name. Until next time. God bless.